He is lecturer and research fellow at the Department of Political Science at the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan, where he teaches modules uh, on European institutions. He is also lecturer uh, and research fellow at the University of Bologna, and he is also research fellow at the Italian Institute for International Politics Studies, ISP, uh, in Milan, where we actually uh, met and worked together for a few months in 2014. Uh, Dr. Zotti received his bachelor degree in European Studies from the L'Orientale University in Naples. Uh, he has a master's degree in International Relations from the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan and another master's degree in Political Theory from London School of Economics and Political Science and PhD in Institutions and Politics from the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore uh, in Milan. His research interests uh, revolve around political theory, theory of European integration, EU foreign policy, migration studies and uh, diplomacy. And he has published extensively on issues uh, regarding European politics and the question uh, of migration uh, in, um, in relevant to the European Union and uh, EU uh, countries. So. Uh, we are very much looking forward to uh, your talk and uh, without further ado, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Sally. Let me just start by, uh, by thanking, first of all, the department of the BUE for having me here, for inviting me here. Uh, populism. Uh, populism and uh, uh, the European Union. The two things uh, do hand in hand here in, uh, in Europe, uh, within the European Union particularly, uh, because as we're going to see, uh, populism as uh, at least over the last 15, 20 years has been redefining itself based on, mainly based on position uh, with vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the European Union. Uh, anyhow, it might be useful to start uh, with uh, something that I hope is not uh, too boring or uh, not so interesting. That is uh, a quick review of the uh, conceptual battle that is going on for a long time about definitions of populism. Um, this battle is uh, pretty important, uh, seeing how there's been, over the last few years, a kind of acceptable backlash from critics who wonder if populism has ever actually existed. Uh, in the sense that uh, it is quite common uh, to be met the idea that the dispute over the meaning of populism is just an academic squabble. Uh, it's just... Uh, a, or... Uh, more uh, dangerously, is just an argument in order to uh, put out of the political field uh, non-mainstream ideas. Uh, the, the idea uh, underlying this uh, backlash is that there is no real populist in uh, politics. There are just people, attitudes as movement that the political center misunderstands and fears. And so media, mainstream media, wants us to fear them too, although without the burning of having to explain exactly why. In this sense, populism are framed as a, the boogeyman of European and world politics, a non-entity that is invoked for the purpose of just stirring up fear. And it is hard to deny that much talk of populism obscures more than illuminating what populism actually means and tell us more about what anti-populist is than any real live populist parties or voters actually look like. Anyway, long before populism became an object of transatlantic media fascination, that is, be before it became a one-word explanation for everything that goes wrong, uh, with politics, there were, there were already a small group of academics that were studying it, trying to figure out exactly what it was and what lesson could be drawn from the actual implementation of, of so-called um, uh, populistic policies. 
uh, thanks in large part to the persistent failure of governments across the West to enact anything that might resemble a credible vision ahead for shared, prosper for, for shared prosperity and security in the post-manufacturing era, we are now living through a time when familiar webs connecting citizens, ideologies and political parties are at least beginning to loosen or shift if not completely falling apart. In this sense, populism is an idea that emerges in order to uh, respond to the failure of traditional social structures. Now that parties do not have their social basis as they used to, there are no uh, working class for social parties to refer to, there are no uh, conservative or the bourgeoisie class for, conserv for conservative parties to represent, uh, populist in a sense, uh, in this idea, in this very basic uh, definition uh, of the concept, uh, is an experiment in trying to rearrange uh, social loyalties, connections, and to represent them in, in political forums. Um, as a result, the question of populism is not going away, meaning that we might well do without the idea of populism once populist parties are defeated, but the very um, the, the underlying conditions, the underlying circumstances that have made populism rise uh, to significance are not going away anytime sooner because we don't see any new sort of social rearrangement going on. Uh, alienation, uh, social fragmentation are here and there is nothing new uh, on site. Uh, the common years are likely, on the other hand, to include all of the following uh, factors. More movements being labeled as populists, more movements that call themselves populists, more movements that define, that defensively insist that they are not populist, while others call them populist, and more conversations about the extent to which populism and the problem or the solution. So, in order to respond to this uh, very tricky, hairy situation, uh, Kees Mutter, uh, this um, Dutch political scientist, as early as in 2004, uh, proposed a new and concise definition of populism, uh, that is, uh, populism as a high, uh, this definition of Muda was in a sense uh, um, uh, draft in order to counteract the idea that popul populistic politics was just uh, a portmanteau for highly emotional and simplistic rhetoric. That is, populism are, populists are just opportunistic uh, politicians that want to buy the support of their voters. For Muda, on the other hand, Populism is, is much more than just demagogy or opportunism. Populism, uh, in Muda's words, is not a full-formed political ideology, like socialism or liberalism, for instance, but it's just a thin ideology made up of just a few core beliefs. The core beliefs can be boiled down to two ones. The first and the most important one is the division of society into two antagonistic parts. The people, on the one hand, understood to be fundamentally good, and the elite, on the other, understood to be fundamentally corrupt and out of touch with everyday life. The other core belief that is shared by most populist, most so-called populist parties, is the belief that Politics should be an expression of the general will of the people. That is a set of desires that is presumed to be shared as a common sense by all ordinary people, whatever ordinary people means. The people and the elite are groupings with no static definition, of course. And they can change the way party, the way populist parties define what the people is and what the elites are changes depending on the situations, on the country, uh, they operate, they mainly operate in and so on and so forth. These categories are first and foremost moral categories. People are good, 
as said, elites are bad. The question of exactly who belongs in which group, though, depends on the character of the populist movement and which thick ideology the populist ends up attached to. So in this sense, we can see that populism tend to latch onto old ideologies, but only as far as the, uh, the maintenance of these two core beliefs uh, is allowed. A populist people can define itself, for instance, as an ethnic group that feels under threat by foreigners, but it can also be defined by a shared sense of being victims of economic exploitations by uh, fellow nationals. What matters in this division is that the blame is always put on someone that is outside of the normal people, of the regular people, that is, the corrupt elites. The thin ideology definition is also extremely congenial to the landscape of contemporary academic political science, uh, if you want to look at ourselves for a little bit, because it places a considerable premium on broad frameworks that enable scholars to do empirical quantitative work. And so, as far as we have we as uh, political scientists have an impact on reality. In a sense, we are uh, fueling uh, the discourse on populism because we study it. And we mostly study it based on, on the idea of populism as, uh, as a thin ideology. There are, however, other, other scholars that contest this idea and, um, and that see, uh, populism from a, a completely different perspective. These academics think that defining populism in terms of core beliefs is a deep methodological error. Many of them also think that define populism as an ideology may be an ideology in itself. Uh, these scholars, just to name a couple, uh, are uh, the, the main names that uh, one is bound to meet are Chantal Mouffe and uh, Ernesto Lacau. Uh, both thinkers have directly informed the new European left populist movements, including Syriza, Podemos, and uh, Mélenchon's La France Insoumise. These academics are likely to stress the extent to which mainstream political parties in the US and Europe have converged in recent decades. Narrowing the range of opinions that find real purchase in national decision making. So basically, they say that populism is just the reaction to the fact that uh, mainstream parties tend to become more and more similar to each other. There is no difference. There is no difference left between right, uh, right, left parties or uh, left wing parties. Um, the policies they present to their political platforms, uh, the policy that they actually uh, implement once they seize power, they tend to uh, inform, to be informed by neoliberal, uh, neoliberal tenants. And so populists are bound to emerge in order to contest these uh, unnatural consensus that has been forming over the last decades in the center of the political spectrum. They take as a given that these as, as well the ranks of people who feel that what is usually called democracy, that is a political system that respond to their concern, doesn't work any longer. And, they, and these, people, these people that tend to vote for populist parties, they feel that uh, democracies respond much more uh, rapidly and, uh, and effectively to the means and the whims of small, wealthy, self-dealing class of elites. Elites who vigorously deny on their parts, they, they participate in the political battle, but at the same time, they benefit a lot from the uh, presence uh, in, the, in the ruling positions of mainstream parties. They are also instinctively alert to the possibility that self-preserving center will try to uh, defeat challengers 
by making anyone who endorses them appear unreasonable, frightening and constitutionally unequipped for the sober task of governance. So we have these two ideas and these two ideas have been uh, on the table for quite a lot now uh, and in a sense they've produced very little in terms of uh, actual ability to understand what's going on in the, in, in, in the European Union and in European Union member states in terms of participation of populist parties in uh, political processes. So in a sense, um, in order to, to, uh, to make up for this gap, um, a, a group of scholars have come up with an, a, a new uh, classification of parties of, of, of populist parties that tries to uh, com combine uh, the, two, the two strings, the conceptual strings in defining populism, and that proposes these two, uh, th th these four categories. Um, we have radical right-wing parties, which are exclusionary, authoritarian, with a strong nativist appeal, and which use conspiratory explanations of liberal democracy. Then we have radical left-wing populists, which are inclusionary, non-authoritarian, with a weak nativist appeal, and use a radical democratic approach. Meaning that in, in this category, we might include, for instance, Podemos or Movement Five Stars in Italy. Illiberal post-communist parties are exclusionary of course, uh, the idea of inclusionary and exclusionary populism is based mm, mostly on the, pro, the, the, on the proneness to the uh, conflict with parties that are pro-immigration or not. Um, and uh, as I was saying, illiberal post-communist parties are exclusionary with strong nativist appeal and use conspiratory explanations of liberal democracy. Of course, here, this category would include Fidesz, um, Orban's party in Hungary. And then we have anti-establishment populists and political entrepreneurs, which are not authoritarian, have a weak nativist appeal, and tend to have radical democratic appeals. Here we can put, again, uh, it overlaps a bit uh, with the second one, uh, and we might uh, include in this uh, the, the centrist wing of the uh, movement Five Star in Italy or uh, parties in uh, Northern Europe, uh, in Sweden, in, uh, uh, in Denmark and so on and so forth. So, what about the connection of populism with uh, the European Union? As I was saying at the beginning of my speech, uh, Euroscepticism has been one of the main source uh, of consensus uh, and one of the main reasons why populist parties have been rising in prominence in European politics. Uh, because in a sense, uh, the idea of the European Union as a distant, uh, non-directly uh, elected, uh, non-directly elected elite uh, sits quite well with the idea of uh, a political, a, a political or a political elite that is against normal people.